Hey, qué tranza pandilla, bienvenidos a Vans Channel 666. El día de hoy tengo el privilegio, el honor de entrevistar a uno de los músicos más prolíficos, o el mito, la leyenda, el dios del fuego del infierno, el mismísimo Arthur Brown, uno de los padres del short rock. Gracias a él, a él le debemos muchas, muchas cosas de los shows que conocemos hoy en día. Gracias a él tenemos a gente como Alice Cooper, como Kiss. Eh, por supuesto, ha sido un largo viaje el que ha atravesado el señor Brown, así que vamos a platicar con él. Es un verdadero placer, estoy muy, muy feliz. Así que vamos a ver si está por ahí ya nuestro invitado, eh, Mr. Arthur Brown. Vamos a ver. Hello, hello, hello. Hi there. How are you? Doing very well. It's a, <coughs> it's a very clear day with a lot of frost on the ground. That, that's cool. That's really amazing. Thank you so much for your time. It means a lot. Uh, I know this is not the only interview in Mexico, but this uh, is one of the first, uh, uh, or maybe it's the first one for the band, for bands, Bands Channel 66. So really appreciate your yeah. time. I have a lot of questions. A lot of fans send us a lot of questions. So I'm going to start. I hope you, you're ready. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm ready, ready. Uh, thank you. The, the first question is, do you remember your first contact with music and how did you start in the world of rock and roll? Oh, uh, in the world of rock and roll was uh, through Elvis Presley and Little Richard. Oh. And they, they had uh, this, a, a radio station in England, Radio Luxembourg, that uh, when everything in England where there was only a very small amount of modern music played in those days. Um, they, they had, you could listen to Radio Luxembourg all night. Uh, and so they played uh, the American hit charts. And, um, and so that's where I got introduced to rock and roll. Ah, uh, that's amazing. I can, how do you feel when you discover this kind of music, for example, Elvis or Little Richard? Oh, I mean, it, it was like a, a different world because uh, England was still very European in its mm -hmm. musical taste uh, and very English. Eh? And uh, <laughs> so the, the idea of people leaping around the stage and, uh, you know, being very active and dancing and, and the rhythms pounding out, uh, uh, African style rhythms actually, aren't they? So. Uh, That was, uh, it was like fresh air because uh, I was born uh, during the Second World War and um, there was, you know, England was poor. There was not much money. There was, eh, you know, people were still in this a kind of state of shock mm -hmm. and they were looking for some other way to look at life and uh, where, where had... They were thinking, where, where has our whole way of life led us to uh, this big war? So that when the American music came in, it was something new. It was a, a, a very positive and very energetic. Yeah. And so that was, that was great. Wow. And of course, and of course uh, new hairstyles, new clothing styles. Hey. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really cool. Uh, next question, uh, talking about the, the beginning of rock and roll in England. How was the local scene in the UK during the 60s before the explosion of uh, rock and blues? I can imagine you and many other bands start in small venues playing for just a few people. Yeah, the, there was a lot of um, semi-professional music in those days. Uh, we went through the skiffle craze. Uh, which was one uh, led by Lonnie Donegan. And um, the, the rock music was played in bars and only gradually did it get to be bigger. And of course, in, in a lot of ways, uh, initially they were just copying the American music because that's what they were listening to. But then you got uh, people in there who who drew from the English music hall tradition, uh, some people dressing up like uh, 
you know, the Undertakers. There was a band called the Undertakers. They dressed up as if they were going to bury people. <laughs> so it was very much like uh, characters from Dickens with big, yeah. tall black hats, black suits, long, uh, you know, long, thin trousers. And um, there was also in the later part of the, the rock, there was um, Lord Such, who also yeah. liked to screaming Lord screaming. Such. Yeah. And he, uh, he kind of, he was between the two because I think it's right that he had Jimmy Page in his band uh, for a while, you know, from Led Zeppelin later, who's uh, famous for. Um, yeah. And so Lord Such had a great band, and but his his visual performance was like being at the the music hall. Then of course we had our Elvis, which was Cliff Richard, yes. and um, it went through the same kind of periods it did in America. We, uh, Elvis would come out with uh, Jailhouse Rock. Little Richard would be doing. Ah, uh, uh, let me see. I got a rock and a hole. Saturday night, I'm just got pain. Rules about the money, trying to save. <laughs> um, and that that was like a powerhouse, like a volcano standing yeah. next to you. And then that would uh, be accompanied by, in America, you know, and to a certain extent, England, the, the idea that, oh, uh, that's a violent uh, music. So the, the next thing was the media would close down a bit. And the next thing that the artists that came up looking the same as the, the big rock stars were more family oriented. And they'd be singing ballads and um, they were all very nice ballads, but um, like it, it wasn't like in America, where they had Carl Perkins, who mm -hmm. yeah, even yeah. in the time when everybody else was doing these ballads, he was still rocking it out. Um, but we, we, we did have uh, various people who uh, did not obey the, the normal. We had, uh, I remember a little later than that, PJ Proby, who came over from America and had been the Stand Elvis when Elvis wanted to not sing any more of it when he was recording. PJ probably would come in and do the singing, and uh, he had a great voice, and he was a showman, extraordinary. He he looked like uh, what was later a hippie. He had a big ponytail, yeah. <laughs> uh, long hair, dressed like uh, one of the three musketeers, and. Um, <laughs> was uh, totally outrageous and and actually really good too I, th I thought he was um, and that sort of worked, acted as a bridge because people started to think well if he can do that I'm, I'm sure I can do something as different than normal people that's very um, important that I think that's very important because they inspired to you to create something special and you create you you create a revolution not you and other people like The Who, for example, at Zeppelin, uh, I don't know, uh, John Majal, for example, Cream, you create something special, you change the, yeah. the rock and roll in general and the life of many, many people around the world. That's really, really cool. Yes, and um, uh, you mentioned The Who, and I remember Pete Townsend in uh, one interview telling everybody that uh, his model was a band called The Shadows. Yeah, and they were um, largely instrumental, uh, and they did rock, uh, the old style of rock. And and Townsend said, but they were the the real band that was on the road. They were a working band, and so he got got his uh, influence from that. And and the Who were <laughs> always have been a working band. The uh, do yeah. a lot of concerts. Yeah. yeah. Talking about Pete Townsend, I, I read in Psyche, Psychedelic Baby magazine that Pete Townsend 
was the producer of your first record. Can you tell us how was the experience and if you remember the recording process of, the, of your first album? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I was, uh, let me see. I had come out of uh, college yep. um, where I was singing with what, what was the beginnings of a mod band called the Southwest Five. Uh, that one came to an end and I formed my own band, uh, The Crazy World, which was a multimedia band. And so uh, it was a show which at the time was uh, not normal. <laughs> and so, in, for instance, in the year before us with Pete Townsend, we had three concerts in, in the whole year wow. because we were so, so different from what other people were playing. Uh, I must say we had exceptionally good musicians. Um, and then at a certain juncture, I joined what was called the Ramong Sound, uh, they later um, got a, a three-year record deal. And at the time, I was their co-lead singer with Clem Curtis. And um, the, the company came down and said, we want to uh, record it. We want to give you a three-year contract. So they changed their name to The Foundations. And six months later, they were number one in England with a soul record. But I, when they said three years, I thought, oh, three years uh, doing uh, this soul music, which I love dearly, but I, I preferred what we were doing with The Crazy World, which was more experimental and psychedelic. And so I turned it down, and there were the uh, uh, foundations at number one, and we were still earning 35 pounds uh, for a concert. Wow. But, but by then, we were the kind of the house band at UFO, which also featured, of course, the Pink Floyd, Soft Machine, Mark Bowen. Oh, wow. uh, you mentioned all, all the stars that came up, wow. were played there. And we were kind of the regular band. Um, and and we the audience were very uh wishing you to do things that they had not before and <clears throat> sing about things they were concerned about which was how do we live in a different way how how can we base life on play rather than work um can we have a different kind of politics, which is more concerned about human beings than money? All these questions. Um, and it was at one of those concerts that Pete Townsend came down. <clears throat> he was invited by um, the guy who had been the publicist for Brian Epstein. And he came down and uh, went away to the record company, uh, which was Track Records, who were doing Hendrix and, uh, uh, and The Who, a very experimental record company that also knew how to be commercial and how to uh, sell things and, and to be aware of all the current trends in art and music. And, and so that was the background we were in. Townsend came in and they said, hmm, interesting. <laughs> and Townsend said, yeah, he, he's a performance artist. It was strange because the people didn't talk about those things then. He said, but he's a, he's a performance artist who can sing. And uh, so they said, well, let us, uh, let us hear something. What, what are you suggesting? And so Townsend came and said, come to my studio wow. uh, and we'll make some demos. And of course we did uh, a lot of music from our set, which included a lot of the pieces from Fire, the album, the Crazy World album. Um, and Townsend played it to them. They said, wow, 
Yeah, and, and so they came down and saw me uh, performing and the band performing. And um, that was why we were taken into their, uh, under their wing. Yes. And we, we had, while Townsend was playing them there, we were playing down there and all the major record companies knew that in America, the underground had managed to become a, a commercial phenomenon. And so they wanted that in England. So they came down and they were talking to us and we, we thought, oh, well, they don't understand what we're doing <laughs> or, why we're, or why we're doing it. So we're not really interested, but we got taken out to a lot of very fancy dinners. Wow. And, uh, well, they, they told us what they were going to do for us. And um, in the end, we turned down everybody except that we decided Pete Townsend um, was a performing artist himself. And the Who were, you know, they were a band that, that went against the grain. They, they, uh, they were pretty outrageous. And I, we said, said, well, this man's father was a classical composer, the, the leader of track records, Kit Lambert. And so he must know about music. And our keyboard player was also a trained classical player. So he thought, oh, that was, that's good. And we thought Townsend, when he was telling us what, what he thought uh, a record should be and how, how could we go about things, really was very impressive and, and helpful. He wasn't telling us what to do. He was suggesting things. And, and I remember one tune, uh, Give Him a Flower, um, and then another one, uh, what was it called? <laughs> Spontaneous Apple Creation. And when it came to record that, I said, well, Pete, I haven't quite finished it. And he said, oh, wh what, what haven't you finished? I said, well, I haven't written a tune for the verse. He said, well, why don't you speak it? Like, a, And so like, oh, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and... Um, and so, and that, but he also encouraged us if we came up with uh, ideas to stretch in a different direction. He was yeah. right behind it, going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." That's right. And of course, Kit Lambert was actually the main producer, and uh, Pete Townsend was the assistant producer. And Lambert loved excess. He loved excess and loud noise. And his, his father was the classical composer. So <laughs> he would, we'll be playing uh, our, our music, which in those days, uh, the keyboard player played a Hammond. We didn't have a guitarist, but it was early days of Hammond. It was a small Hammond. And so uh, gradually as the recording went on, we managed to move up. They came out with the new uh, organs and the C3 became, or the B3 initially. And, and Lambert would just take the, the track as it came out and slide the control slider, which governed <laughs> the tones and the volume into until it hit the red. <clears throat> and then everything was distorted. And uh, then he would record that and then alter it and so, for instance, uh, we would be in about eight years ago, we went in the studio with some very good producers. They could not get the same sound. You know, people don't use the, the, the old sliders anymore. They were trying to get it with the modern equipment. Could not get the sound that uh, Kit Lambert had because he was a visionary, you know, in terms of listening yeah. and being a picture of what could happen. And so that, that was a very growing uh, period for the band and myself. Yeah. Yeah, for myself, I would sing and I'd sing it the best I could. And then occasionally Lambert would say, well, 
because he was well accustomed to uh, classical singing. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just try and do it this way in that place of the tune? And uh, let's see what we can get from that. Uh, this, this is good at what you've done, but we need something more than that. And so uh, it was a growing experience, not only to learn how to operate recording equipment, what to do in the studio, who were to keep quiet, who you were supposed to be listening to when you were actually talking to one of the other musicians about fish and chips or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's it was a very and then then the the drummer was playing in a style lambert took the record over to america when it was finished as far as we were concerned and they said well this was atlantic records they said well you know this is not the the rhythmic style that our audience are going to respond to and so uh, Lambert came back and said, look, we've got to make some alteration. And he said, I know one thing we can do, which is to put on this record strings, because then we change the, the emphasis and we can bring in different rhythmic things along with the, uh, the, the keyboard. And um, so, and, and also the brass sections. Uh, so you had strings and brass like a classical liner and uh, that was I think one of the very first um, uh, doing that in this studio so it, it was a very very creative position and, and, and Townsend and Lambert would say right this tune you've got uh, when it comes to the last part, I notice that sometimes you sing different lyrics. I want you to improvise for the last five minutes. Uh. And so I would just make up the tune and the melody and the feelings so all on the spot. And uh, that was a, a very great introduction to, oh, you know, you can do that and people will listen to it because I, I love doing the improvisation. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine in those days the, you know, the technology was different than in these days where, I mean, went to the studio is a challenge. You don't have these multi-effect pedals like in these days. And also I read in an interview that you are one of the pioneers that start to use the drum machines. I don't know if that's true. Yes, that, it was uh, later than <clears throat> later than Fire. Fire was recorded partly in '67 and then mainly '68. Um, but the drum machine uh, I first recorded with in '72, '73, wow. And uh, it was a totally different experience. We were the first band, we were the first band in the world to base ourselves around a drum machine and have no drummer. I played the drum machine and sang. And so that became, it took five years before people in our audience thought, well, I can make a band like that. And so it, it was three to five years after we uh, did our own first uh, album produced by Dave Edmonds, the rock and roll singer, um, with, with electronics, drum machines, synth players, and, wow. you know, it, it was, uh, yeah. yeah, it was again a... a uh, an amazing learning uh, because sometimes the drum machine in those days if you had a very hot night in a club where they didn't have windows then there was uh, sweat falling from the ceilings yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it would fall into the machine and the machine might go off oh. and 
when you're going to play your set, it will go, no, 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 I'm going to play what I want. And so you have to <laughs> make up things on the spot to go with the drum machine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you are, you are the godfather of short rock. You start to combine the theater with rock, rock and roll. So tell us what inspired to combine these words, uh, theater and rock and roll. Well, I'd always, uh, you know, since I was young, I loved theater. Um, and they, the, the thing was that I, in 65, I went to Paris, my first professional engagement, uh, played in Montmartre and stayed in Montmartre for uh, six, nine, 12 months. And it was a very wild club. Um, and so one evening I was uh, in the dressing room and this woman brought in a small child, her child about eight. And the, uh, he said, ah, you should black out your teeth. Paint your teeth black. And I, I laughed and said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I got home, I thought, well, I wonder what effect that would have. So I did the next night and the audience, because we had some good lighting, uh, they were all, oh, oh. Wow. And, um, <laughs> and then one night in, in the hotel, they'd had a wild party up, up the corridor. And when I woke in the morning and opened my door, there was a, a crown with candles on it. Uh -huh. And so next night I took that down to the club, blacked out my teeth and lit the candles. And so the audience loved that. And then when it came back, I went back to France to England um, and we were playing down in the uh, UFO. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had, I was living in a kind of bohemian household and there was an artist who lived there, Mike Reynolds, and he uh, expressed an interest in doing our light show for the, the band. And so we used to talk a lot and we talked about uh, we were both interested in, you know, magical symbols and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, I, I can paint those onto your costumes. Wow. So I got these right. And there were the, all magic symbols all over the costumes. And between the two of us, we th thought, well, candles on the top of a uh, of a, a crown is one thing, but why don't we try a plate with petrol in it, Ooh. gasoline? <laughs> and so on the first night it exploded. Um, and thereafter, uh, I, I had a leather strap went around my head and then there was a screw went through the strap, through the bottom of the plate and then onto the uh, I would screw it the tight and the, and so we did that and that uh, for one night was great after the second night I was became aware that well the heat is traveling through the screw onto my skull <laughs> and, and it's very painful we must find something else so we we thought of the idea of putting making it like these magic symbols going back into pagan magic um pagan beliefs and all of that and, and bringing them uh and the way, way of life uh more in connection with nature and and so uh, we we put the horns up and then put some flame of material inside the horns yes. and had the plate 
we had the plate, but then put a, a small cushion underneath it, but the plate would wobble. And, and so it started, <laughs> on one night it, it wobbled on, and the petrol set my clothes on oh. fire. So it was like, okay, what do we do now? So then I, the strap underneath, I couldn't make very tight because it went, then I'm a powerful thing like this. <laughs> so what we did was we said, well, why don't we put from this mythological, magical stuff, two small wings down either side, they'll stop the plate from wobbling. So then I had a helmet with wings and flames coming out of the top wow. with these magical symbols. And everybody thought, wow, that's a pretty, uh, pretty strong image. Yes. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, I had been watching on TV uh, the, uh, the, the English Music Hall mm -hmm. where they they had, you know, old fashioned Dickensian theater as well as songs. And some were very strange songs. So we, I started to introduce my own version of those into this, the act. And, and also, um, there was these, at that juncture, there was travelogues on TV, people traveling around Africa. Wow. And and film of the witch doctors and their dancing. So I started to learn the dances from the witch doctors and they became part of my stage act. Wow. Uh, you know, and, and, um, <laughs> and so the, the whole thing came together and I, I had read all of Shakespeare's plays and, and I, read various other theatrical things and so i i had uh, tried out with mime and i brought in a, a kind of serious approach to it um, I, I practiced a lot and studied from different people that's amazing because you create something special in general for rock and roll. You screaming, uh, Lord Touch, also screaming, Jay Hawkins. You're like at the pioneers of yeah. this this movement. The combination of theater with rock and roll, and also the show. The show. I mean, th thanks to you guys like Alice Cooper or Keys. Even in these days, we have these black metal bands with the coarse pain, the, the pain in the face, and you're a pioneer of that. So you create something special. I mean. For me, it's very special, and I say thank you so much because you create something unique. And well, uh, our fans send us two questions uh, about some myths. So I want to ask you if that's real or not, and I'm going to read these questions for you. The first myth yes. is, is real that you had the idea to create a band with Jimi Hendrix? Uh, yes. Wow. Um, the thing was that uh, we... You know, when Fire became number one, we played uh, quite a few festivals where we were in the top four of the billing, and Hendrix was also. Uh, he also, of course, um, did did work with uh, track records, and actually, uh, when Fire became a hit, it was because Hendrix went round all the what were then called black stations and said you've got to play this this track and so put on fire and so all of those stations started to play fire ah. and it was partly partly because of hendrix and he we we had a period in new york where i did a lot of jamming with him and we had a, a, a time down uh, a, a club in New York called Steve Paul's Scene, which was where after you'd played in New York or if you came to New York for a dinner and wanted to go out and experience some music in a different uh, kind of way that wasn't the band doing their set. It was different musicians coming together. 
So one night we had John Lee Hooker, Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> myself, and uh, yeah, and so we we jammed and we did maybe you know an hour and a half set made up completely not based on any songs and so about uh i know at that juncture um jimmy really liked vincent crane's keyboard playing as well he liked me at that time he didn't like his own singing he liked me as a singer and a frontman so he he called me into his uh, hotel and he said, uh, why don't we, why don't we make a, a band together? And he said, I'm thinking of the people in the experience and your keyboard player. So that would have been the band. And um, he wanted to have a, uh, tapes of Wagner in the background. So he wanted, he was already like uh, uh, John Coltrane, looking at what, what are the backgrounds of the music I'm playing? You know, there's the blues, there's African music and European music. So he wanted, uh, he, he loved the tones in the, of, of uh, Wagner. And so he wanted to have Wagner playing in the background while we were doing our stuff and a, a, a huge projection show of lighting and and stuff, Not rather like they would be now. But uh, obviously the year was slightly different. And um, so that, that was, we, we were... Uh, beginning to do that when suddenly uh, I was on tour and the keyboard player, uh, somebody kind of spiked him and he had to go back. Uh, he was in the mental hospital for uh, I think six months. And that, that was by that time that came round again and, and I started to think, well, I, I love this idea, but I do have ideas of my own of a different kind of band. And if Vincent isn't there, that's a different, different, uh, different kind of lineup. Yes. And so I, I didn't follow it up. And the next thing was Jimmy was doing um, uh, with uh, the trio, the blues uh, trio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, back to back to his roots. Yeah, uh, another uh, this kind of myth is if you know that George Harrison in the Beatles session says, "I'm are like Arthur Brown, the god of hellfire, and fire and asha tree, and run around the studio." Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, I, I read that. I don't know if that's true, but I read that uh, about George Harrison. So I am. The Fire, like Arthur Brown. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do remember when when we were making the record uh, in, and we were doing work in Abbey Road. Yeah. And the Beatles were running around with a candle on their heads, <laughs> shouting, "Fire! <laughs> I am the god of hellfire." <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, another question for you is if you remember, uh, well, if you tell us about the experience of participating in the movie Tommy uh, by The Who, how was the experience to participate in a movie? Yeah, that was the, uh, I'd only ever been in two movies before as a film extra. Oh, really? Tell us more one about was, that. One was, yeah, I, I don't talk about it much, but... Um, one was holding the head of the horse in one of the horses next to Beckett in a film called Beckett, all about, uh, you know, the times of um, the English kings and the, uh, the, the battles that they had in England over the throne. And um, the other one was a film called This Sporting Life, 
and that one was with Richard Harris. And uh, I sat at a table in a nightclub. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but that, that was one of the scenes. So I had no real knowledge of making movies. Um, and Ken Russell was, of course, a, a very uh, extraordinary man, great energy, great capacity to visualize what he wanted. And so I, I gradually realized that's how he worked because um, I, I was initially going to do one of the, the roles. Um, uh, one was the one that uh, Elton John did, Pinball Wizard. Oh, yeah, Pinball that, Wizard, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, the other one was uh, the one that... Uh, um, Oh, gosh. Ah, uh, don't worry. But, but at the end, you, yeah. you play the role of the priest. Like. <laughs> yeah, well, t uh, uh, um, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, Eric, Eric Clapton was uh, in there playing the, um, the preacher. Yeah. And... Uh, for some reason, he didn't want to do it after a certain point. They'd already done some of the filming. So I came in and I sing the last verse and the last section and do a bit of wild dancing in, in that. That's what I do in the film. Um, and so what was fantastic was... Uh, Ken Russell would say, right, give me what you've got. So, oh, that's right. He, first of all, he said, right, you're doing this. I, you've got now, uh, a, a, from the Marilyn Monroe grotto scene, we're going to give you the dances. So now I want you to go into the room two doors down the corridor. You've got to work out the dancing. You've got to work out what you're, what you're going to do. And uh, you've got to be back here in half an hour and we'll film it. So we, we went in there, made up little moves and things. Then came back and uh, Ken Russell said, right, off you go. So we did it. And, and he said, uh, no, that's not it. So I did it again. <laughs> no, that's not it either. Go and talk about it. Go and talk about it. Do it again. 23 takes later, <laughs> I, I, decided, I thought, well, this, this is never going to work. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting bored with it. I'm tired and uh, it's early in the morning. And I, so uh, it was at that juncture when I was in the middle of thinking that, I said, do it now. <laughs> and I did. And oh. he said, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and the thing is that when he when he makes a film, he watches you doing it and he sees you doing it in his mind. And if you don't reach the, the right level of intensity or integrity in it, that's it. So he, you do it again. He's got it in his mind. He's also watching you to see if you're really into the part. And if you're not, so uh, by the time we'd finished, it was what he wanted. And, but I got a call, I got a call uh, two months later saying, we've, we've decided we'd like uh, a slightly longer scream at the end. Uh, would you come in? Can you come in? Uh, in three days at uh, 8.30 in the morning and do one of these screams. Uh, well, I'm usually uh, almost just gone to bed then. So it, it, it was a bit early, but I went in, did one take and that was it. And so, <laughs> and I will say about Tommy, when it first started, 
Pete Townsend was writing an, an opera, I think it was going to be about China, and it was called Rayo. And he uh, wanted me to be the lead character. Wow. And it was Kid Lambert who said, no, Pete, Pete, we've got to keep this. This is the, the change that you're making with writing. You, we've got to keep it for the band. And he said, yeah, but I've, I've written it with Arthur Brown in mind. And so, you know, Lambert was uh, the one who was in charge of management of money. Yeah. And so I didn't do the Tommy, yeah. but I think, you know, Roger Daltrey is an amazing Tommy. So there you go. Yeah, talk, talking about movies, you released a new video that it's part uh, of the movie, The Black Room with a special guest such, such as Carmina Peace, Brian O'Hare. So tell us a little bit about this new version of Fire. Oh, yes. Well, of course, the, the, uh, the version that has just come out of that record is with Carmin Apis uh, and with Brian Auger on keyboard who was, uh, yeah, one of the great keyboard players <laughs> and uh, somebody that I, I really enjoy with. And then uh, it's got James Williamson from the Stooges. Uh, so it's, it's got a, uh, a, a very varied um, and very talented band, if you like, behind it. Uh, and and uh, I, I believe it's true to say that It was put out by uh, a record company, Cleopatra. Yeah, Cleopatra, uh, yeah. They, they have, uh, for instance, in my case, they asked me, would I like to do a horror album? And so there was a horror album. Uh, and they said, well, we'd like you to... Uh, do the, uh, the voice in England. So we, we did it sort of long distance. They put down tracks with the different people. And, uh, but as, as we went through it all, the, the characters, the musicians changed from track to track. So uh, on the first track was BJ Harvey, the Psycho Billy uh, guy who's ah. fantastic and so we i wrote a song with him and we produced that next thing i knew uh alan davy ex hawkwind yes. uh was in there and he he was coming up with quite amazing uh music and we would we would talk with him long distance and we why don't we look at this Why don't we introduce this instrument? All of that. So it, it's been a very interesting process indeed. Uh, it's really, and I love the new version. Uh, I really want to watch the film. So I hope, I hope I can catch the film soon. And also I have a question. I can imagine uh, poetry is an important part of your life. I remember that you You read some poems for the record of Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, The Chemical Wedding, inspired by William Blake. Can you tell us a little bit? Oh, yes. Um, William Blake. I've, I've always loved William Blake. And uh, I'm just in the middle of a, reading a new book about him that is just explains him in a totally different way. Um, but Bruce, Bruce used to come down and watch uh, my second band, uh, uh, Kingdom Come. Yeah. Ow. And so it was because of that that he, uh, he helped, I got once. Um, and he, he helped me a lot then. And it led into being on his record company, uh, Sanctuary. Yeah. And him... Uh, getting me to do some work with with his uh, solo material. 
That's really cool. Also, um, well, this is a long question. I'm going to read this. At this point in your career, you have released 17 studio albums. I know which, which one is very important and I'll have as a concept behind it. Can you resume briefly uh, for for young audience this amazing journey and which ones are your favorites? Oh. <laughs> I know, I know it's a tough question. 17 albums, uh, yeah, it's a tough question. Um, well, the, the the one that had the uh, the story, if you like, so, was obviously the Fire album. Yeah. Uh, although um, Galactic Zoo also has that, and the uh, the album um, Vampire Suite has that. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, which ones of the other ones has it? Oh, uh, oh, oh I've got to think. Yeah, um, I mean, 17 albums, yeah, I, I can understand. It's a lot. <laughs> there's, about, there's about five or six that has one. Um, and uh, they, they, they all come together, actually, as part of a one story if you like, um, which is what we tell in our new stage act. Um, we're using a lot of different technology, uh, an absolutely astounding show. Um, and we, we have taken the lead from the, we, we play some of the fire album, but the, the way that Kingdom Come played things and the electronic side of it was what we drew on for the overall tonality of it. Um, and, and so that would be the, the, do you want to know the story? Uh, sure, if you want, yeah, yeah, we can. Well, the, the story is uh, about, about somebody who's looking around uh, he can't make sense of the world anymore. It's moving too fast uh, and it doesn't appear to be geared to human beings, you know, it's... Uh, and so um, he goes into this state and, uh, and he's living in... The, the, to, to him, the world is a nightmare. And so um, a... a there's part, part of his mind takes yeah. on a character and it's a female voice and it says, there's only one way out, go bathe yourself in fire. So next thing he's surrounded and uh, he's gone down and he's burning in, in the fire. And uh, the characters come out of the fire of the normal kind of mentality that we use, the dualistic mentality, yes, no, good, bad, black, white, you know. Um, and so first thing to come up is the voice that says, I am the god of hellfire. And so that's where that song came from. Ah. Um, then the voice comes in and says, God, brother, you lie. And that is his opposite twin, who's not hellfire. It's the, the fire that is warm, creative, light, full of light. And that's another song called Come and Buy, who wore, and in the same way as different costumes. So you, you get the idea of a character, although obviously, in a way, it's just one aspect of the person who had the nightmare in the first case. And so then that, that uh, uh, disappears. And then there are other characters who come in, um, one representing love and uh, also romantic love. 
one representing uh, knowledge of the everything in the universe, um, one representing a teacher, uh, and in the end, he comes to a, uh, a, a character or a voice that, that is, um, he, he, he is speaking, saying to this character whose story is the whole album, uh, Child Kingdom. Uh, catch the drops where war lies bleeding from a child of fire and uh, a tree full of dew drips where your mind falls into mine and we cling to our fine religion new thoughts from old and and it's it's a kind of he's in this garden it's not the garden of eden but it's the garden where he experienced wholeness, beauty, and the darkness of life. So that's the story. Wow. And it's it's amazing because you, your music is not just the innovation in technology or riffs or just sing. You have a concept behind. You have a message for all the people, for young, for old people. And I think that's part of your legacy as Arthur Brand. It's not just another record. Each record is different. You can find a concept behind these records and that's your legacy. So thank you so much for, for that. And thank you for explaining us that, that concept behind, behind your music. So also I, I'm going to, to read this because my English is not the best. So uh, I, I wrote something for you special. I hope you like it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so your legacy is undescriptible, undescriptable. For rock and roll and metal, you inspired acts like Alice Cooper or Kiss. The idea of combining the theater and special effects is part of the DNA of the industry. You are a pioneer, and we feel grateful to having you here today. So thank you so much, Arthur Brown. Oh, thank you. It's, it's been a very interesting interview. And, and uh, we'll be able to come after maybe we come and do a tour, only to tour hopefully, Mexico. Hopefully, hopefully. So, so what's next for you? I mean, I know it's a pandemic, but what's next for Arthur Brown? Do you have any plans for tour or for yeah, well, record another album? We we are um, we have one that will be coming out uh, very shortly now mm -hmm. uh, on the Prophecy label, and we've just done. <laughs> they, he does each year a uh, a concert mm -hmm. uh, for all his artists and he has a lot of artists on his label and they are you know uh varied a lot in the stone and rock mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but know also that. you know and, and uh, some heavy metal and and folk uh, yes. really uh, it's it's not necessarily pretty pretty folk it's folk that they try and go back in the period that they're singing about, the pagan period. Um, and so we we uh, did our set there, and uh, we were we were concerned because we we don't uh, necessarily we're not necessarily a band that people would put in that mm -hmm. group, um, but. Uh, Initially, when we came out, I mean, I've got wings, I've got all of these things on. They, they was like, oh, they looked a bit stunned, you know. But soon they were jumping up and down and shouting, and uh, everything got very nice and wild. So uh, I think now we're 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 about to uh, we're discussing anyway. They're doing a concert for the um for his label again wow in america in december of this wow. year and so we're discussing that now going to going over to do that it is a show called a human perspective is what we do and it has uh, a lot of electronics in it it has you know jazz influence it has uh folk influence we bring in as many modern influences as we can 
and um, it tells this story as we yeah. went on through. Um, and we also, with that stage act, with that act, uh, show, we have a tour booked in England doing uh, theatres mm. so that we can have the proper lighting and the mm. curtains and the, all the projections will be successfully done. Um, so th th that's, that's that. And we, which? May and June. Oh yeah, that sorry. That tour is May and June in in oh, okay. in, uh, in in England. In England, oh, we're okay, discussing, okay. and and with that show in America, we're discussing an American tour as well. Um, and also for prophecy, I'm about to um, do the next album, mm -hmm. and this is a very experimental album. Um, and we we hope in both the experimental album and this new prophecy we may actually have come up with a hit record <laughs> so we're we're getting we've got they're slotting in lots of radio play and everything so we'll see about that that'll be uh um if we do that happens say after june uh i'll be 80. <laughs> right. So, having a hit when you're 80, that's all right with me. <laughs> ah, t thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. We will check your social medias, Arthur Brown, on Instagram, God, uh, God of Hellfire Actual is your Instagram. So, thank you so much, Mr. Brown, for your time. Uh, and we got uh, Facebook. Yeah, Arthur Brown. Oh. It's, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. yes. So th thank you so much for, for everything, for your time. It means a lot. I hope someday you can come to Mexico. Maybe if you come to the United States, maybe you can play here in Bands, uh, Bands Mexico, House of Bands Mexico. It will be an honor to bring you to Mexico for the first time. So yeah, let's see what happens. So, but thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Yes. Lovely, lovely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.